Thanks again very, very much to Pancho Guedes. We continue now with our next uh, participant, Michael Craig Martin. Michael Craig Martin was born in Dublin, was educated in the United States. I visited the other day Chuck Close, who told me about their extraordinary class, their extraordinary year. This was Chuck Close, Richard Serra, Michael Craig Martin, all going um, to the same school, receiving his MFA degree from the Yale School in 1966. He came to Britain on completion of his studies and has lived here ever since. His first solo exhibition was at the Rowan Gallery in London in 1969, and he participated in the definitive exhibition of British conceptual art in 1972, the new art, at the Hayward Gallery. Since then, he has done hundreds of exhibitions. Again, if I would read the list, we would have a new marathon, the List Marathon. Um, uh, he has uh, had retrospective exhibitions, uh, most recently at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in 2006. Um, and he decided or proposed that we would make this rather as a conversation based actually on a, an extraordinary map he had sent us for the marath marathon. A very warm welcome to Michael Craig Martin. Thank you, Hans Uri. Uh, I noticed that you're the one who's sitting here, nobody's introduced you. And I'd just like to say, I'd like to introduce Hans Ulrich to you, uh, who must be the greatest introducer of people to other people in the whole world. More, and I don't just mean the physical thing of, you know, this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so, but of introducing people who would never otherwise meet, to bringing, to bringing together an amazing number of people. And I think he should be acknowledged for doing this amazing thing. Now, to begin with the beginning, Michael, I wanted to ask you, it was extraordinary when we started this process and started a little bit like John Brockman, that's somehow what he does with Edge in the science world, we are doing uh, with this process. In the art world, that we would um, meet artists and speak to artists about our project, and your map um, uh, arrived, it must have been about six months ago, and we might have it here uh, on the screen, because maybe we could start with you telling us a little bit about this extraordinary map. Well, uh, when Hans Ulrich asked me about, uh, t spoke to me about maps, and he said something about making maps, and I, I, I didn't know what to do, and I thought about it, and then I was thinking, well, about what ma maps meant and about the, the, wor the maps of the world, and I was thinking that the most important thing that was happening in the world was that every, all the centers of power were shifting, everything was in, in exchange, and all the things that were familiar were, were, were starting to become unfamiliar, and that maybe we needed to think about the world in, uh, in the, uh, maybe it, could, it was possible to make a map that made one think of the world in slightly different ways. Of course, I didn't realize exactly when I was doing it that I was going to manage to offend virtually everybody on Earth, because, first of all, there's all the people who come from the countries that are not actually included, all of Latin America, Africa. Uh, so they, they, there's a reason for them to feel uh, uh, upset. The other, uh, the other offenses may be because maybe uh, the, the people of, uh, of Mongolia are unhappy to be called Portugal um, and have discovered that the capital city is Kansas City. Um, and what I did was, uh, I, I, obviously it's a map of Asia, I took only the countries of uh, the European Union and I renamed all the countries and then I took only cities in the United States and I renamed all the cities in Asia with the, the names of American, of American cities. Um, I'll just show you, that's the, li that's the list of, the, um, of what happens, of, of the exchange. Uh, and, all, virtually all of these are quite arbitrary. Um, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I had spent a great deal of time working out exactly what city should, or what country would be which, but I did give it some thought where I could, but there were other places obviously where it could only be arbitrary. But it does make one think about the world a little bit differently, I hope. There's also a thing about order and disorder. We had earlier yesterday Amari Sozovoiti here who, uh, having uh, actually uh, written so much on Alighiero Boetti, talked about his maps, and Boetti always talked about order and disorder. Every order hides many other possibilities to show something, which is... Well, I, 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 one of the things that's always talking about maps is really there are way, so many maps have to do with describing power in the world, and, and that so I've kind of taken the three centers of power of Europe, uh, the United States, and Asia, uh, so, there are, as I say, there are whole sections that are uh, very obviously very important but are left out, but in this, this, great, this great shifting of powers, that seemed to me to be uh, important. And 
Uh, I mean, I, I told Hans Ulrich that there was, uh, when I was a child, my father had a, f a fantastic old atlas. It was one of those really big atlases that was referred to earlier, where they were published in incredible colors and incredible detail. It was filled with detail. But one of the things that really struck me about that atlas was that there were pages where there were big sections of the world and they, they had no detail at all and written across the section of, of, of parts of Africa, of the Amazon, of uh, Australia, of other places, it just said, unknown. And in my lifetime, there was a map of the world where great sections of the earth said, unknown. It seems so amazing today that, you could, that that could be true. Yeah, so the idea of latent and empty things on map, I mean, something you uh, once talked about also in an interview, that you, you, you talk about lots of empty things, and in map there is a lot of empty things. I mean, the other day, yesterday, a lot was talked about the spaces in maps which are not occupied, and you talk about the latent energy, and very often in your paintings there are empty pictures or empty screens, or...? Yes, I, 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 I mean, I, you know, if I draw a book, the book is a really, to draw a book is really to draw a, a picture of something with the important thing of the words in it, but I never draw the words, I only draw the book. And somehow that, that stands in for the, the, the outline, which is exactly what a map is. It's an outline that leaves out everything else. And you are, you are really, you're really being asked to fill in the bit that isn't, that is the, the part that's not given. And yesterday we had Tim Robinson here, who is a conceptual artist um, who actually he was in the 60s in the art world in London and then decided to become a map maker and he basically went to the countryside and lived, uh, and now he lives in Connemara, he lived in very remote areas and started to make these very meticulous uh, maps and mapping processes and this map mapping then made him a novelist and uh, that sometimes prompted me that, you know, to think about your films again because there is this whole un not so much known body of work of yours which uh, still a very small body of work. Small but yeah. important, which is your, your early films. And actually, one of your earliest films has to do with Connemara. When actually you mapped somehow uh, Connemara in a film, and it had to do with things. I mean, you said nothing is happening there, so you kind of mapped the few moments when something happened there. Can you tell us about this, this film? Um, I don't know if, if uh, anybody here has ever been to Connemara. It's in the westernmost part of Ireland. It's very, it, it's incredibly beautiful. It's very, very bleak. Uh, it's difficult even for tree, the, for trees to grow because of the. It's so windswept. Uh, it's it's the part of Ireland that was most hit during the famine, and so there was great poverty in the in the west. And it really, you go, you, you see it, it, the the land the landscape is often broken up in, into small plots of uh, with stone walls. But the 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 stones have obviously been taken to, from the field to build the wall. But the field is still full of stones. There's enough stones to keep plenty of there. And w when I went there, which was in the very early 60s, it was. It, had, it was an area that had died, 90% of its population had left, and uh, it's, it was just on the verge of being revived. Of course, now it's full of tourists and everything, it's not nearly as nice as it was when I was there. It was truly like being on the edge of the world, and I thought the reason I liked it, I, I thought it was the most wonderful place because in a certain, in a dramatic sense, there was nothing dramatic. There was nothing moved. There was nothing there. There was nothing wonderful. It wasn't romantic. It wasn't a romantic landscape. It wasn't a heroic landscape. It was very, very quiet. And there was, and so the tiniest thing—a bird flying, a little braid of black grass—that seemed really interesting. And that's what that's what intrigued me. And there is another film, and I thought in the context here of the Royal Geographic uh, Society, we should talk about your lost, your legendary lost Machu Picchu film, because uh, this was a real expedition, because at this time, not so many people went uh, to Machu Picchu. It was somehow not uh, yet touristic. Um, and you made this big journey and made a film, but the film is lost. Yes, un unfortunately, the film, uh, the film was lost. It's out there somewhere. If anybody finds it, could you call me? Um, <laughs> And uh, it was, it was at, at, at a time when uh, very few people uh, went there. And uh, it was, 
whereas the, the, the Irish film was, uh, it, it was interesting because it was also a place, a, a different kind of end of the earth, and where, again, where there are stone walls and there's a kind of absence, there's an absence of a civilization, there's a kind of remnant of people who were there, that's, and, and then that's the, the kind of, this kind of lost society. So that's the two only films. Are there other unrealized films? Maybe. <laughs> To talk more about maps, because there are many other layers where maps play a role in, in your work, and when I looked at your, your book, the retrospective book, and also the Dublin exhibition, one could obviously also think the way you bring in um, a lot of objects into your work is a form of a mapping of very quotidian things. And you once said that you were from very early on drawn to simple objects, because you're interested if you take a pile of wood and you assemble it in a certain way, it becomes a table. And if you assemble it the same pile of wood in a different way, it becomes a chair. So I was very curious if you could talk a little bit about this mapping of quotidian objects. Yet it's not a very big number. It's a certain number of objects which you combine in many different ways. Well, when I first started to draw things, I, I just thought, well, what was the simplest thing that you could do? And it seemed like drawing a single object was, the, was the, the most basic thing. So I drew a table, and then I drew a chair, and then I drew a shoe. And as I started to draw, uh, in the beginning, I thought, well, I'll be doing, I could do this for the rest of my life. There'll be, you know, there'll just be thousands and thousands. If I just keep doing this, I just do one after time. If I spend, I'll never have to think again. I'll just be able to do drawings every day. And quite soon, I discovered that I was running out of things to draw that they weren't infinite, and that nearly everything is a variation on something else that exists. There are hundreds of versions of things. Uh, but in terms of the basic things that make, the, the, the things we make to make our lives, there aren't very many of them. And so, it, it, there, uh, you know, extending Hans Ulrich's uh, uh, idea, it is a kind of mapping of what it is that, um, that are the, the fundamental elements of how we, how we find our place in the world, how we make a place. Um, and again, they are, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I've always drawn things that I, I've, I've, I've never done a drawing except for an, from an actual object, but I've always thought that the drawing itself exists. There's a philosophical idea with, that there's, on this side you have a generalization, and on this side you have a, the particular object this chair, and then over here there's the general concept of chair, and that's an example of the general concept. But there's a, an idea in philosophy that there's another play, thing in the middle between the two, which is neither the particular nor the general, but is that, that, that is somehow, uh, it, 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 it's called, it was called a virtual object before virtual meant uh, something to do with, with um, uh, the computer world. Um, and I've always thought that it somehow exists in some kind of idealized way just before it becomes a generalization. And um, uh, I've always thought that that's the kind of, that that's, there's something about that world that seems very interesting to me to draw. One thing which is obviously totally striking about the map is the colors. And we earlier listened to Jos Cortens who told us about uh, his publishers wouldn't allow him to have so many colors and that maps becoming more and more yellow, hence his invention to actually produce a lot of different maps with very few colors. Um, I sort of researched a little bit things you said about colors and you somehow um, use very often the same colors. Uh, you say I only use 14, 12 or 14 colors um, and you say they are mixed in order to to create a color that doesn't look mixed. Can you tell us about the colors of this map? Well, when I, when I uh, started to use color, I discovered exactly the same thing about color that I discovered about objects, which is that there aren't very many. And it, it, you can name all the colors, and then everything else is just a variation of about 10 or 12 colors. And uh, so, I mean, obviously in the, in the map, but I wanted to do, I wanted to emphasize the differentiation between things, and, and really, Color is such an interesting way, there are so many interesting ways of using it to make things distinct from each other or, to, or you can group and separate things, you can, uh, you can, and it's got nothing to do with the actual color, it's got to do with the colors in relation to each other. Well, with some countries, they have an awful lot of other countries bordering them and I didn't want any two countries to have the same color as itself, bordering itself, so that started to mean that I needed quite a few colors. 
but, I, but also as a way of very clearly emphasizing borders. I thought it was incredibly interesting. I learned more about Africa this afternoon than I've ever learned in my whole life. Just a few people speaking was amazingly interesting about Africa. That, that map that David had that showed Africa with the bands going across it, showing you the different kinds of, ter uh, of uh, the desert and the, 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 the forest. I thought that was so amazingly telling. And there's a map that ignores national boundaries, whereas mine is is the, and which is, of course, the, always the one we see, which is the map showing boundaries. Whereas, and that's, of course, what I'm actually emphasizing here is this sense of these contained, uh, and which are very often incredibly artificial, and in certain parts of the world, of course, have, are constantly shifting. These borders are not fixed either. So, I mean, I went through, went through all your books uh, yesterday. I found lots of other works related to maps, and I brought this book here. It's an untitled wine glass from 2000, which is also a globe. Um, and you use these globes. I mean, it's a recurrent element in your work, the, the globe. Can you tell us about, about these works? We don't have it as a slide, but I'm going to hold it up. Well, well, to, uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I always think of the, the globe as the simplest uh, representation. It's the simplest way in which we represent the whole earth to ourselves. And uh, and and, I, and there's, you know, you can draw a map of the world, but it, it's funny if you draw the globe. When, in my globe, there is no, there are no, there are no continents. I don't even draw the continents. There's just the globe, and the the, the circle is blue, um, because you don't need that. Because you don't need, I don't need to fill in that stuff. Because as soon as you see the the, the object, it's almost a toy object. It tells you that. And one of the things that I was thinking of, thinking about maps and about the, the world is um, uh, the, the most, uh, and something I was trying to get out here is that the, um, the way that the world we suddenly see have, have to see the world as spaceship Earth, like uh, um, uh, but Mr. Fuller said, and he said it in 1963, and people found it very hard to understand what he meant when he first said that. And it really wasn't until there was the first, those, that the most fantastic picture, a photograph, among the great photographs ever taken, is that one of the Earth from the Moon. And the first time you get back far enough, you can look back and you discover that it's this beautiful blue thing out there. And it's so, it's the, obviously the most amazing thing in the, in the universe. And, uh, and you suddenly understand that we're all on this spaceship and it's, it's going through the Earth. And he, when, one of the things he says is it's, only, it, it's, uh, it's so small and it's so cleverly designed that um, uh, people were on it for thousands of years and it's only recently we realized we were on a spaceship at all. And it's, it's such a great I idea of us being on this spaceship and, and how we have, we, how our, all of our, all the things of the Earth, all our um, resources are so limited. If, you, if you're trying to supply oxygen for, for somebody going up in a satellite, you know it's a very, you've got very, you have to be very careful about supplying the right amount, you have to use it carefully. All of these things we are very careful about controlling, and of course that's now what we have to have understood we have to do here with the whole spaceship has to be run like that. It's fascinating because that was actually the same um, uh, idea of the spaceship of Buckminster Fuller was picked up by philosopher Peter Sloterdijk in his keynote speech at the Verkleine Conference in Copenhagen uh, a few months ago. Now, I know we're running out of time, but I've got a couple of very urgent questions, maybe two very urgent last questions. One is uh, maybe a sort of a different kind of map. I saw an exhibition in Berlin a couple of months ago, which was an exhibition of works, actually, of many artists you've taught. It was a, a, a group show, and uh, an incredibly impressive group show, all very well-known artists who were your students at Goldsmith. Uh, so that was a kind of a mapping of your, uh, of your, your, yeah, of your pupils. So I was wondering <laughs> if you can tell us a little bit about the, your teaching and kind of that, that sort of map. Well, I suppose I'm, uh, uh, one of the things that um, uh, when I was a, a student, uh, we, I can remember we used to have conversations about, you know, the, the way students do, about um, what's important in the world and what's important to us and what's going to be important in the future. And, uh, you know, was it going to be fame? Would we get, we, we'd be famous? Or, uh, in, uh, nobody really thought about making some money in those days, but we did think, you know, about the, could have a very nice life. Or the, and then we decided that influence was really 
the, the, the greatest achievement, and if you could, that if you could have, if you could be of, of some useful influence to others, that was, um, that was about the best thing you could do. So my uh, hope in teaching was that I was of some use to, uh, to other people in that way. Now, a last question in MAPS topographic refers to the visual description of the terrain, whereas topological is more concerned with relational information. And one can imagine that in the age of exploration maps, we are kind of primarily concerned with topography. I mean, many of the maps, of the old maps, one would have here in the Royal Geographic Society, as the face of the Earth has become more familiar with satellites and Google Earth and so on, um, could one then maybe assume that cartographers are now more in a topological field. From that point of view, also, I was curious to know more. You said before when we had coffee that the kind of end purpose is maybe not so obvious anymore, that somehow a map is not necessarily anymore from A to B. Well, I, I think in the, in the past, the, the, in, in most things, in, in like, certainly, uh, I mean, it's a, really an essential aspect, an idea in modernism, that somehow we're moving t towards something. We have an A, we have a, we have a purpose, we have we have some place we're trying to get to. And one of the things about the way we have to live now is you live a life without knowing. You, can, you start a career as an artist, you start, you start a life, and you have really very, very little idea where this is going to, where this is going to lead. And it, I mean, it, it always strikes me as so amazing, you know, even on my phone, there's that thing, that fantastic thing you can do with Google Earth, where you can choose the manner of the map. You can see it as a satellite picture, you can see it as a topographical map, you can see, there are so many, and, and all of these things are so instantly at our fingertips, and it just changes your whole relationship with how, uh, uh, with how you understand the world. You know, that, that amazing thing of zooming in on your own house. I'm sure we've all done that. Zooming in on your own house. Many, many thanks, Michael Crick-Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much.